Well, welcome to another episode of the Addy Hour. It's my pleasure to be able to host these conversations and to really continue to talk about topics that I think are central and important for us as a society. And so today, I'm again honored to be able to welcome two guests from different walks of life who are going to be able to share their unique experiences, but also share some parallels and overlapping themes as well. Uh, the topic for today's conversation will be, where do we go from here? And I think in a lot of ways, this is a highly relevant topic and conversation. I mean, to be completely honest, it seems like we're just going from one tragic event to the next on a weekly basis, sometimes on a daily basis. And so I think it's really important for us to be able to sit back and process how we actually move through that. So I'm honored to be able to host today's two guests. The first is Dr. Amy Arnston. And Amy Arnston is the Albert E. Kent Professor of Psychology and Neuroscience at Yale. She directs a research lab where she looks at and researches the processes and circuits in the brain that are affected by stress and by aging and how those can lead to cognitive deficits. She's made a whole host of different research, seminal research contributions to the field over the years. She's also a member of the prestigious National Academy of Medicine. And so we're thrilled to have Amy here with us. One thing I will say, one of the things I really appreciate in addition to all the accolades is how Amy leads with passion. This is something you can see in the classroom when she's teaching, in the research lab, and in how she engages in society. So Amy, welcome to the Addy Hour. Definitely grateful to have you here with us today. Thank you so much, Nate. A joy to be here. Our second guest is none other than Lecrae. Lecrae is a multi-Grammy award-winning platinum seminary artist who has evolved into a New York Times bestselling author, entrepreneur, speaker, thought leader, and philanthropist, all while co-owning and serving as president of Reach Records. So he's someone who's had a lot of impact in a lot of different spheres. He's also sold millions of copies of his music worldwide, has won multiple Grammy Awards, Dove Awards, a Soul Train Music Award, and also has a B, had a BET Hip Hop nomination. But again, in addition to all the accolades, one thing I really appreciate about him is how invested he is in community and how he has continued to make those investments in several different ways. One of those more recent has been all the initiatives that he's taken part in and really trying to rebuild the west side of Metro Atlanta, in addition to other things that he's done in the Atlanta area and worldwide. So really grateful to have Lecrae here on the program with us today as well. Thanks for being here. Honored, honored, sincerely. So we're ready to jump into this conversation and excited to really think deeply about this aspect of where do we try and go from here. Um, for any of you who are regular listeners, you know, one of the things I like to do is really to check in with our guests first, just to see how you're doing in the midst of everything that's going on. Um, clearly, this has been an, another tragic week for us as a, as a society with ongoing killings of black men and boys at the hands of police. Um, and it's heavy. I mean, that's a, an honestly heavy place to be. I mean, I can say personally, a lot of times I move through a lot of different emotions when those things come up. There's a, a feeling sometimes of personal fear, just being completely honest. There's feelings of frustration, anger, there's feelings of exhaustion and tiredness. And sometimes I know I even shift towards being a little bit numb to just seeing this kind of happening over and over again. And at the same time, I know that I have a deep need and desire for healing and hope. So it's really a mixture of things and it, you know, it kind of moves depending on the day and where I'm at at any specific point in time. But I thought it'd be really good for all of us, the three of us here and for our listeners to really at least start out talking through how you're dealing with everything that's going on in society and even in your personal lives. Um, so Amy, if we could go ahead and start with you, if you'd be willing to share. Sure. Um, and I also feeling uh, weary from such a continued stress. Uh, much of the past year for me personally, I was so worried about my mother, who's um, mm. 99, which is wonderful. But she was in an assisted living facility, and it was a real race between the virus and the vaccine. And mm. thank God the she got the vaccine. Um, and it was the same thing, you know, with the election, where it was just this um, overwhelming anxiety. And thankfully, Biden won. But at this point when, you know, I have this very childish feeling of, oh, can't it all be all better now? Mm -hmm. And instead, dealing now with the real problems that are still very much there. So, for example, my mother has gone blind and how to help her. And then at a, a national level, you know, uh, today as we talk, just the national anxiety about what's going to happen in the Chauvin trial, you know. 
Um, and I think um, over the past four years, so much got exposed about the many weaknesses in America that we had so hoped had, had really been solved a lot more uh, than it has. And this realization, we have a long way to go. And um, uh, that's going to take a lot of, of help. Um, we have to really take care of ourselves mm -hmm. and each other if we're going to make progress. And to relate to today's conversation, I find for myself that understanding how the brain responds to stress has really helped me have compassion for myself when I'm feeling inadequate and not living up to what I hope to be. And I think it's wonderful to have this opportunity to share this here today because I think compassion and forgiveness, whether they come from science or religion or art, mm. uh, helps us to heal and can give us that strength we need. Mm. That's so well said. Thank you for sharing so honestly about even the personal challenges and what the places that you find hope and healing in the midst of this as well. Lecrae, what about you? How are you managing <clears throat> at this current moment? Well, <clears throat> you know, it's, it's interesting. Um, I think, you know, 2016 is when I really, 2014 through 16 is when I really uh, found myself hyper-focused on a lot of the um, racial tensions and political tensions in America. And I did not consider how it would personally affect me. I think I just went in blind and not recognizing and real I didn't understand uh, the science of stress or anxiety or depression any of those things um and I, I just you know uh stuffed all of those emotions and feelings deep down inside which ultimately resulted in a, a mental breakdown mm -hmm. and I think from 2018 until now I'm so much more aware of you know what hyper focusing on all of those particular things um can do to me and so um i think in this season of life i'm i'm working to process solutions i'm working to process um how we can navigate and and the, and and positive things that we can we can do in light of it all because I think you can become a nihilist in a lot of ways if you just look at how crazy everything is. Mm. So for me, um, I've been trying to be helpful in as many ways as possible. Um, I've been trying to figure out how do we how do we uh, invest in potential Dante rights, um, invest in in in, in the, the younger generation of George Floyd's. Mm. Um, to create awareness and insight uh, so that they can find themselves in a, in a healthier place in life. And, um, and then at the same time, um, you know, thinking through, um, you know, what it looks like to communicate empathy to um, law enforcement and people on the other side of the aisle. And mm -hmm. so uh, all that to say, uh, to get super scientific uh, for some people. I am believing in neuroplasticity. I am trying to focus on new things <laughs> so that changes can happen and healing can occur in my mind. <laughs> well said. Well, I was joking before we got on that we were going to flip the roles a little bit, have Lecrae expand on the neuroscience and have <laughs> Amy talk about her experiences with music. <laughs> and there's room for that. There's room for that. But I appreciate you sharing you know, a little bit of the journey as well. Um, and both of what you've shared, both from, you know, personal experiences and what you've tried to do. But I'd be curious to hear you expand on that even a little bit more on what you, because you talked about how you've gotten to this place. What have you seen be effective in your journey? And on the flip side, things that you would also say that have been ineffective that you would have avoided or that you would do differently going forward. Yeah, I think <clears throat> um, one is, is, is understanding your limitations, you know, there, there are certain things that you can know about, but you may not need to, to see. Um, and I think in this, the, the age we're in, um, I'm grateful for the accountability of video. 
but it doesn't mean I need to watch all the videos. Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean that's healthy for me uh, to see people being murdered uh, via via video. Um, and so part of it for me is is not inundating myself with that um, with those visual with those visuals. Um, you know, figuring out okay, what am I doing? What kinds of things can I do? that make me feel like I'm investing and I'm working toward change. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's been helpful for me. Um, and then more or less is um, in light of everything going on societally is I've, I've had to find myself, where's, where does my hope lie? And what am I grateful for? And, and how can I meditate on those particular things uh, more often? Um, the things that I wish I would have done different is I, I think that um, I found myself very hyper focused on all of the negativity and I did not look historically at the change that had occurred and that what, what it may take to see more change occur. I just looked at, you know, the, the kind of the pessimistic side of everything. And, um, and I just found myself very low and uh, very, uh, it was a dark time. Mm. And, um, and if I could go back, I, I think I would have learned that hyper-focusing on all that was not healthy for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I think that's something we'll probably come back to in this conversation too, even thinking about how we, how we get into that hyper-focused state and what's happening in our brain that allows that to occur and ways to even manage that. I think it's mm -hmm. also great that you brought up the idea of hope and healing as well. And Amy, you were hinting at that and mentioning that when you talked about your perspective with neuroscience as well. So I'd be curious if you could share for our listeners how you got into this journey or your journey to get to this place of thinking about the neuroscience um, of stress and resilience, and then also how that helps you even more so with the hope that you were talking about. Sure. Um, I actually began um, wondering about neuroscience and stress when I was a teenager. Mm. Uh, we had a lot of illness and death in my family with loved ones um, when I was um, that age. And I watch as um, like my parents, um, people around me who you were lying on as a kid and suddenly they're this, this swirl, you know, there's, there's a quicksand there. You can't rely on them anymore because they weren't thinking straight. And um, I, I actually began volunteering at the state psychiatric hospital in New Jersey to learn more about mental illness. And, it shows how old I am that this was a time when um, um, there were these um, huge hospitals, um, 2,000 patients. And you can argue whether that was better than having people out on the street homeless. Um, but volunteering there, I got to know um, several patients quite well. And one gentleman had schizophrenia and had been an astrophysicist. Mm. And um, we were able to talk about astronomy in this great way, totally logical. You'd never know he was ill. And then one day while we're doing that, um, someone mentioned the name of this really cruel doctor. And just hearing that man's name, um, th this gentleman just instantly dissolved into what's called word salad, thought disorder, one clanging uh, uh, phrase after another that really didn't make sense. And then as he calmed down, he his thoughts recongealed and we continued our talk about the solar system. And it was like this explosive seed crystal to me mm. of this shows I have to understand what stress does to the brain because mm. it's such a clue as to what's underlying um, so many disorders, including schizophrenia. And so I've really um, studied it ever since. And, and thankfully, we've been able to make a lot of progress. And, and what we've learned, we meaning the field as well as me, that when you have a stress that makes you feel out of control, that's a key part of it. If you feel up to it, uh, these toxic changes don't happen. But if you feel threatened or out of control, you get this flood of chemicals that takes what's called the prefrontal cortex offline. And the prefrontal cortex is one of our most newly evolved 
uh, parts of our brain that subserves abstract reasoning, top-down control. Um, so you really need it when you're going through a complex uh, stressor in particular. And at the same time, this flood of stress chemicals strengthens our primitive circuits that make us unconsciously react our emotional reactions and habits. So it's this double whammy where you're losing your rational cheerleader and at the same time strengthening these primitive reactions. And um, your brain can really get in a rut where it, it develops a vicious cycle and gets stuck there. And so a large part of what my lab is trying to do is understand what is it that makes prefrontal cortex weak versus stronger mm. so we can develop medication. So if you're in a rut, uh, you can uh, get some help on uh, getting to a healthier place. So um, it's it's been a long journey because I'm an old woman, uh, but I can Wise really woman. trace it back <laughs> to to uh, those childhood experiences. Yeah, that's really powerful. I mean, to know that that initial experience had such a long term impact on you and your trajectory and your and your passion. I think that that says a lot. And the fact that you're, I mean, it sounds like, and you're you're motivated by the people that you're serving in a lot of ways as well. Yes. Yeah, very much. And sometimes that person's me. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what, uh, I'd be curious to hear even more about that. How, how does that part come into play, the person being you? Because I know, if, you know, it's, it's a tension. And sometimes there are ways that different of us as scientists kind of reconcile that in different ways. So it'd be great to hear, you know, how you've done that over the years. Well, some of it is when I find myself um, uh, losing it. Mm. Uh, you know, look, I was saying finding your limits. Mm. And um, I've also really come to say, okay, I can feel that my brain is not going into a good place. Stop watching the news for hours on end, mm. you know. Mm -hmm. Let's go for a walk in the woods. Um, that um, knowing what your own limits are and mm. what makes you feel better, which is individual for everybody, but learning that. And so you can take care of yourself better. Mm -hmm. And I'm also taking one of the medications my lab discovered, but that's because I'm an old lady. I'm not just a, a stressed person. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I think that's, that's powerful in a lot of ways. And I appreciate your, your honesty in sharing that as well. Who can say that? Who can say I'm <laughs> taking the medication my lab discovered? That's just like I don't, I don't, I have no comprehension of this. It's amazing. That is, that is, that's a good point. Well, we don't know if it's working though. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> we can, we can ask those around you. I have a feeling they would say it's working. <laughs> Look, great. How, how do you? I mean, you react to it, but how do you react to? even the components that Amy's talking about in terms of how the brain's working. Like, does that, hearing that now and thinking backwards to what you've already talked about, does that give you even a way to interpret some of the things that you were saying? Yeah, I mean, it's just, I'm fascinated. Um, I think like organizing chaos is something that's very fascinating for me, you know? And I think um, the the idea that I walk through life and, you know, all the chaos that just ensues, I, I, I didn't have categories for what was happening. I didn't have language for it. Like, oh, this is stress I'm feeling. You know what I mean? I don't, I don't think I had a context for it. And then even to go steps deeper and talk about, well, my prefrontal cortex isn't working properly. And, you know, all those things are very helpful. Um, it, it, some things are just obvious to us. I, I really, I'm, I'm grateful for the, the, um, kind of playing field being leveled as it pertains to mental health, um, more so because I don't think people think it's as scientific as it is. I, I think they, they find, they find themselves connecting their brain to their essence, you know, like your identity in, in a lot of ways. And your biology is not the full extent of your identity. Sometimes it's, it's kind of like, like right now, people don't know, I'm, I'm wearing contact lenses. 
but my identity is not that I can't, I don't think of like, oh my gosh, I need contact. So I'm a terrible person. You know what I mean? I don't mm-hmm. think like that. I think, how can I fix this blindness that I suffer from? You know, do I wear some glasses? Do I wear, put in some contacts? And then I can move forward. But it's not like a crushing weight on my worth and my value. But oftentimes in my brain not functioning as it should, like a disorder, you tend to say, I'm terrible. You know what I mean? Like, I didn't know, like I have uh, ADD. I don't know if it's ADHD, but it's definitely ADD. Um, And I didn't know that as a kid. I just thought I was this impulsive, mischievous, rat, irrational person. And now as an adult, it's like, oh, Mm. I wish I would have known that. And so I think it's very insightful and it's comforting Mm. uh, to hear, you know, uh, Amy talk about these things. It gives me comfort. Mm. Yeah, that's really well said. I'm yeah. so glad because it does that for me too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's a place that that we all need to be in a lot of ways. I mean, even the point that you you brought up about leveling the playing field, because not you know not to be too pejorative to us as academics, but we have this tendency to get stuck in our bubble. We don't talk to anybody about the science outside of that bubble, and then we don't even interpret it for our own selves. So, I mean, Amy, I think everything you're talking about, I mean, I see that as unique in a lot of ways, as reflective as you've been about your work and your own emotions as you're walking through that and being able to, I mean, you know, the, the fancy word people use is metacognition to be able to think about your thinking and what you're going through while it's happening. And to be able to have those tools, I think it makes it even that much more powerful to talk about your experience so that those outside of the scientific realm can learn from it and actually apply it and see that we're applying it in our own lives as well. I mean, I think that, I think that's huge. Well, and, and just to remind her that often you can't do that in the moment because mm-hmm. stress is taking exactly those circuits offline, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. then go, not being mad at yourself about that and going mm-hmm. back and revisiting and, and having that. Yeah. 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 So true. I don't, I don't think people sit back and, and tell themselves like, Oh man, my prefrontal cortex is, is short circuiting right now. Like, it, yeah, it's just yeah. I do. <laughs> <laughs> so, on, I mean, on that note, that's actually a great segue. Cause I'm curious, you know, we started this out thinking about where do we go from here? How do we take all of these principles that you all are talking about and apply them right now in our current situation? Maybe mm-hmm. not in the moment as we're seeing another unjust killing occurring, but in this moment, as we're conversing and thinking about how are we going to deal with that if and when it happens again? Mm. Amy, any thoughts you want to jump in with to start off? Um, I want to go back to what we just said to add one more thought. Mm-hmm. That um, I think it's helpful to think of mental health as a continuous spectrum. Mm. That there's this... Um, uh, a continuum between health and illness, and also that a strength in one context can be a weakness in another, mm. including with ADD. There's times when, when having that kind of energy and being distracted by something that's just occurred can be life-saving for a person or a community who's with that person. So, um, uh, I think that helps reduce stigma mm. and and gives us uh, it's both more realistic but also more compassionate view uh, about brain health and um, the recognition that if you've um, had either genetic insults, a physical insult, um, a, a, an emotional or physical trauma, that those are times when you need extra self care. Um, recognizing limits um, um, that can shift and and one can be more fragile, as Lecrae was talking about. So um, really taking care of our our minds, brains, the way many people take care of their bodies Mm -hmm. with working out. And I think some people are already trying to do that with like drinking caffeine, Um, but doing it in a much broader way with all the needs and, Mm -hmm. and that that can help um, give us a, a more effective view on, on mental health. For what you were just saying, um, this idea of how um, do we help ourselves feel more in control? Mm. 
and uh, give ourselves what we need to be able um, to help our self be our better self again. And it's so individual. Um, so it's, again, you have to really know who you are. What are your triggers? What are the things that help to make you feel better? Mm. And important that they're the things that don't make you feel worse in the morning. So alcohol, drugs can make you temporarily feel better, but then you're worse. Uh, what are the things that give you sustained goodness? Uh, even if it isn't so dramatic instantly, it's really there for you for the long run. And, and I think um, there's many things. Uh, for some people, it's things like meditation and, and exercise. Oh, and uh, that reminds me, I got a call once from Ariana Huffington, who was writing a piece on the civil rights leaders of the 20th century mm. and how they had to do self-care to get themselves through um, the long haul mm. and how like Rosa Parks did yoga. And so they really recognized something right from the start. This is going to be um, a very, very long and hard uh, um, mission. We have to take care of ourselves. And, and I think we have forgotten that and are having to, to rediscover it. And so the kinds of things that can help people um, um, feeling gratitude, gaining perspective from that, from walking through the woods is one of the things I like to do um, through community through um, artistic expression and music in particular, I think can be particularly effective because music is so much about emotion, mm -hmm. both uh, expressing it and receiving it by listening to it. And my son is also a musician, so I get to watch this close up. And uh, I get to see the comments on his YouTube videos, just like with Lecrae's where people are saying, I have just lost this loved one and your music has made all the difference to me, giving me hope again. Um, someone who was suicidal and listening to the music gave them what they needed to, to keep going on. So I, I think um, blessings rhyming with stressings is really important, Lecrae. <laughs> so thank you for that. Well said. I right. didn't know you were going to bring out some lyricism. I'm impressed. <laughs> Very impressed. Bravo, bravo. That's that's great. I I would I would wholeheartedly agree um, with so much of what she said. I think you know I I look at my own life in light of everything. You know I was I experienced a lot of historic trauma. I was abused. Um, I experience neglect. Um, you know, I'm, I'm the men I looked up to, I was oftentimes visiting them in prison. And, and I, so I didn't realize those are all contributing factors to my, my development and, um, and my mental health. And so I look, I look at it like, you know, the average person, if you think about their stress level as like a paper towel, um, you know, when you put, if you've got a paper towel on top of a cup or something like that, and you put some, I don't know, some rice on top of that paper towel, uh, it's going to sink down. But if there's like a rubber band around it, you know, it'll, it'll sustain and hold the rice. Well, I look at my historical trauma as like drips of water on my paper towel, mm. you know? And so when someone puts the rice on it, I'm more vulnerable. I'm more vulnerable to, to, to having a breakdown, to having that, that, that stress snap. And I think that's what's currently been helpful for me. I didn't know this in 2014 through 2016. I didn't know that. So I'm engaging these stressful circumstances, not realizing that I'm dealing with a wet paper towel. Mm. And now it's like, I know, oh, I have a sensitive brain, right? Like I'm, my brain is sensitive uh, it's hypersensitive, you know, I, I get false alarms in terms of anxiety all the time. And so, um, I have to 
and knowing that I can think more rationally and I probably have to spend more time. Like she was just talking about Rosa Parks doing yoga. Um, I spend more time meditating on truth. I think if you, if you, you know, they, they say that uh, people who know counterfeit money, they don't study counterfeit money. They study real money so well that when they see counterfeit, um, they, they can find, they can pick it out immediately. And that's kind of what I find myself having to do. I have to spend time meditating on what is true and what is good and not irrational things so that when this false alarm gets triggered in my brain, I can say, that's not what this is. Mm. That's not what's happening right now. And so, you know, someone gets murdered on national television. I think uh, it's, it's, it's stressful to anyone. Right. But for me, I can, without having meditated on, on what's true, I can get very irrational and think this is the end. You know, it's going to happen for me. This is, I don't know, my kids are, you know, and I can just start spinning out of control irrationally, which makes like chaos happen. Mm. And so I have to meditate and say, hey, listen, you know, what's true about this? Okay. Uh, can you absolutely prove that someone's going to kick in your door tonight and, and kill your kids? No, I can't. So let's not go there. Mm. You know what I mean? Let's not get too wound up in that particular place. And, and I found that that's been very helpful for me is really meditating on what I, I know is true to fight back that hypersensitivity going on in my brain. Yeah, that's so good. And that, that ties in, it makes me think of one of the points that you made earlier too, you know, not to get too far outside the scope, but you talked about both sides of the aisle, you know, for mm -hmm. us as black men in this country, but then also for those who are in law enforcement, because you know, I have friends who are police yeah. officers. And if you have listened to some of the commentary, you know, with what happened to the, uh, individual that was in the armed services that got pulled over. People have been talking about the mental state or the hypervigilant state that the police were in when they pulled that person over, what was going through their minds at that moment. And, yes. and we, I mean, we also, you know, have to talk about those situations too. And those individuals where they're coming to that situation from. Yes. So I know, I mean, being on the receiving end of that, you know, being pulled over, you know, I was coming back from a talk at Emory of all places, got back at one o'clock in the morning, on the way home, lived in the part of town that was kind of off the beaten path and got pulled over at one o'clock in the morning for no reason. So, you know, everything that's running through my mind, I was definitely in a hypervigilant state. But then also thinking about the Caucasian female officer that was walking up to my car, what was in her mind. So, I mean, just everything you've mentioned, I don't think we have those conversations enough. I don't know mm -hmm. as much about the law enforcement side, but I feel like it's something that has to be had on both sides of the aisle. And that's definitely a live conversation um, mm -hmm. in a lot of ways. So again, you know, that could be a whole nother whole nother topic of discussion, but I think sometimes we don't talk about what's happening in the brains on both sides and how, once you put that together, I, Amy, I don't know if there's anything you want to add from wow. your perspective about the stressors that come on both sides of the aisle in that way. But Oh yeah. No, and how empathy is our way out. Absolutely. You know, you, you can really understand that when everybody's stressed, um, the worst things can happen and forgiveness all around if you possibly can, how hard that is. Mm. Um, and then why de-escalation mm. uh, can be so helpful and that there are programs and people out there who are actively trying to um, provide de-escalation, some of it based mm. on the, uh, neurobiology, mm -hmm. um, to um, help people who are whose work constantly puts them in these threatening situations mm -hmm. yeah i think that's so important yeah and clearly yeah. it doesn't it doesn't justify anything that's happened but i think it's a part of the conversation that we need to really seriously talk about well yeah, it's the constructive way forward mm -hmm. exactly and and you know one idea that's been lofted out there is that maybe you don't have uh law enforcement respond to every uh, emergency that comes up, right? If they if they're trained to respond to violent criminal activity, maybe they don't need to be called for you know something that that doesn't fall under that scale because you're you're already hyper vigilant, as you said. So you're not thinking to deescalate. You're think you're in your fight or flight mode, and it's it's just a speeding ticket. You know what I mean? And you're in fight or flight mode. So 
So it's, maybe there's some restructuring around all of that. I have a, a friend as well, me, who's a, a police officer, and he told me a story of him. Um, you know, he's he's a black man, but he he's chasing down um, someone who has uh, committed uh, a violent crime. And um, it's like a domestic abuse, if I'm not mistaken. And he catches him and the guy starts fighting him violently. He's on drugs. And, and um, you know, he was in a situation where he was like, man, this guy is really dangerous. And he had to make a decision in that moment, like, as this guy broke f- through a, a hold and took off running, was it worth mm. chasing after him and getting into an even more violent circumstance or situation? And he had to process that. But the crazy part about it was, you know, after that call, he's already, his emotions and everything is heightened. Mm-hmm. And then he's got to respond to another call that's nowhere near the mm-hmm. same type of circumstances. Mm-hmm. And how does he turn his brain down, dial it down to deal with what's in front of him when he's just left a, a brawl, mm-hmm. you know, uh, with a violent individual? And so those are all the circumstances that I don't think we're talking about mm-hmm. and we're processing. Yeah. 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 That's so true. And Amy, all the, I mean, all the tools you've been talking about and the processes in the brain that we need to be aware of, it seems like they're all coming into play and would need to be an essential part of those conversations. Yeah. And, and are there things like people who are specialized in dealing with mental health um, um, emergencies mm-hmm. who could be in that car and there to help them, mm-hmm. um, uh, you know, have pharmacological tools mm-hmm. to deal with somebody who's, who's um, um, really psychotic um, so that things with... Um, physical force don't need to be mm-hmm. used as much yeah. Yeah. yeah much more thoughtful ways of how to proceed and protect the police as well yeah as the other people yeah 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 this is so important i mean to be honest i think that's something we'll probably have a more full extended conversation on on this uh on this podcast at some point because i think it's one that is it's happening in small pockets but it really needs to be a much larger and bigger conversation in a lot of ways so yeah I was curious, just, you know, as we talked about, you both have music ties, but how do you see music tying into this as well? Amy, you talked about the emotion. How, how does the music tie in both in terms of like how we experience things and in terms of the brain? Like what, what is the, the power that's there? I'm putting you on the spot. <laughs> I, I'll be very speculative. Um, um, so in right-handed individuals, Uh, The left hemisphere is usually what uh, creates and understands language, whereas the right hemisphere uh, creates and understands emotion in language. And to me, music is the right hemisphere without necessarily the words. And then, of course, we add words in songs, Um, but you don't even need those to feel the emotion of songs. So that's something I just wondered about. Mm Um, it's thinking about music as um, emotional expression mm. that doesn't even need words. Mm. That's well said. I, yeah, I, 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 I'm, I would not have been able to say it like that. That's great. Uh, this, uh, I, I, I'm in my understanding in, in the learning that I've had. What, one of the realizations that I've had is that I've been writing songs since I was a little kid and, and probably, you know, around 2000 and I want to say the iPhone, the iPhone in terms of like, uh, writing and taking notes and computers and whatnot. I think that was more revolutionary for me anyway, around 2011 and 2010 maybe. And so, I wonder, this is just me being speculative as well, but but I wonder if all those years that I spent time actually using the motor skills to write and to process was helpful for my mental stability. And as I began to switch over and use the keyboard and use my phone to write, was I not getting all the same benefits? Mm. Um, there was something therapeutic about writing down those lyrics 
And I, and also in light of what Amy just said, I love creative expression. I think it's very helpful for me. I think, you know, it, it connects with people. Music does minor chords hit a certain type of part of the mind and the brain major chords get you more excited. But when I have to actually take the creative musical expression and then add concepts and words, it becomes a little tougher. It becomes a little more like of a push uphill. So I'm, I'm wondering if there's something to that and you might have nailed something there. I know I need to have words because it connects with people, but it's just very interesting that um, I can get a kick out of just playing on the keys or you know hearing a jazz a, a saxophone solo and it still um, gives me that same emotion. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So. And it's especially an uphill push if you have to make those words rhyme. <laughs> Tell me about it. <laughs> Tell me about it. Yeah, I'm working yeah. on it. Well, there's definitely something there. I mean, I'm just thinking back, not to disclose too many, too many uh, Addy secrets to my own songwriting days and just the nostalgia that comes with it sometimes too. Like if I hear mm-hmm. something I wrote 20 years, 20, 25 years ago, the place that it takes me back to. Um, granted, you know, that's not, I mean, it's just all the, the positive triggering in a sense, in some ways. Um, that's outside of my realm of expertise, but you all are making me- Now we need to hear music. this music. I didn't oh, even know oh. music. So <laughs> I that's... knew that was dangerous. <laughs> yeah. Don't worry, I won't let you forget about it. <laughs> I'm sure, we'll bring it out. We'll bring it out in some shape or form. <laughs> so me, I also wrote songs when I was a teenager. Wow. But the oh. two of us should put out an album together. Wow. Huh? Oh, okay. Let me find out. It's It's got to happen now. We need that. Yeah. that uh, who knows when two neuroscientists get together, what kind of songs are going to be created? We need that. <laughs> well, you, you got to be pulled into this mix, too. <laughs> All right. I'll, I'll see what I can do. I'll see if I have anything to contribute. You know, the lyrics get a little too lofty for me, get a little too academic for me. I'll try to. I'll try to, you know, be the person to to make it make sense to the common person. Out well, here. I was ready for you to make a neuroscience comment when you were starting to follow Amy with that comment about the music and your writing. I was getting really excited uh, about where you were going to take it. <laughs> I well, listen, I don't, you know, I know the little bit that I do know, and I, you know, I'm understanding the motor skills and the parts of the brain that are trying to work together, and so mm-hmm. on and so forth. And so, again, like I said, I'm all about trying to find um, as much healing as possible, mm-hmm. and. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I'm, it's, it's, I'm, I'm honored to be able to be in conversations like this because I'm always wondering like, what are the new advances? What's going to happen? I mean, look at what's happening. We got my, I drive a car that if I push a button, it, it can navigate itself through city streets. It's, what's, we got to figure something out with the brain. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah. It's important. And on a serious note too, I think it's, I mean, what you're doing by pulling in those pieces and communicating that to large audiences, that makes a difference too, because I think that's part of what has to happen here. We need to have, and I think you were both referring to that earlier, we need to make sure that we communicate that it is the brain that is involved in these things and not lose sight of that because that's where some of the stigma comes, that's where some of the fear comes and all the concerns about, you know, if I broke my arm, I'm gonna take care of that and get it put in a cast so I can heal. But if it's my brain, oh, I don't wanna touch that or, you know, just right. all all of the reactions that come with that. So I think it's right. I think it's critical. Yeah, I think that's such an area for improvement, mm. reducing stigma mm-hmm. for mental health within medicine itself, mm-hmm. let alone within society. Yeah, and also, of course, to make mental health resources yeah. so much more available and and uh, cheap. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I totally agree. Yeah. I, I think it's funny because to me, if I think about like a megaphone, you know, a megaphone is small on one end and it's bigger on the other end. I feel like academia has the megaphone turned the opposite way. Like <laughs> you got all this information and then it's like, it just gets kind of like, yeah. like, how do we get this <laughs> out here to the general public? <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Uh, I, I love this. Type, you know, I'm trying to figure out how to, get it out to yeah. people. There's so much there. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. you know, on purpose, I've been making YouTube videos and posting them on the Yale Medical School YouTube channel uh, to provide this information to the public, uh, to doctors who are not in the same field, mm-hmm. uh, about burnout, for example, especially during COVID. 
Um, so uh, it is my own little way of trying mm. to get that information out there. And me, I sent you one of the links that maybe you can put on the website. Yeah, we can definitely put that up on the website. Great resource. Yeah. That's wonderful. So I know we're running tight on time, but I did want to ask both of you, what, what legacy are you trying to leave in terms of your passion? That we, I mean, all the things that we've talked about. Like, how, how are you trying to make sure that that gets out and continues to make an impact uh, to those around you? Amy, I'll have you, uh, you started with the YouTube video, so I'll have you continue to expand on that. Well, I'm, I'm really hoping that um, we continue to make progress mm -hmm. in creating medications that really help us be our better selves, our better angels, um, so that when you feel stuck and lost, there's something you can turn to that's really um, healthy. I, I also wanted to say something I discovered in preparing for today's discussion. I was thinking a lot about the power of um, gratitude and mm. forgiveness. And so I, I looked and said, I wonder if anybody has looked at what happens in the brain when you're feeling those emotions. And I found uh, a few studies, including one by the Damasio lab. And I was so struck that when you're feeling gratitude or um, uh, forgiveness, it activates the same areas of prefrontal cortex that Rajita Sinha, who was your guest last time, has shown are the very circuits that help us overcome the stress response. Mm -hmm. So a real neural basis mm -hmm. uh, for how those feelings may really help us overcome uh, the toxic effects of stress. Mm, that's so good. That's so good. And I mean, going, it goes back to what I think about what we're told in scripture a lot too, in terms of the importance of serving others. And <clears> in some ways, it's, it sounds to me like the neurobiological basis of what that is doing and just kind of ties, ties everything together. Wow. That's great. I, I felt so too that um, it relates uh, the song Blessings and Religion and Science all together um, by activating the ventromedial prefrontal cortex. <laughs> wow. <laughs> you tied that the way only you could tie that together. <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. And the I, way I see that in the lyric, Lecrae will I'm, be. Yeah. <laughs> Listen. I don't know what to, I can. You know, that's interesting that she says that because, you know, my legacy, I, I definitely feel like my legacy is to figure out a way, um, you know, to process the information that we currently have and uh, to shrink the amygdala so that it, it, it uh, you know, there's got to be a way to shrink the amygdala and and to ignite the frontal, the, the prefrontal cortex, so that it can communicate clearly to the amygdala during stress uh, circumstances. And I think if I can just, uh, you know, write a song that would allow that to happen, then <laughs> the whole world is changed. You know, clearly, uh, that's my contribution and legacy. I'm actually uh, a little bit scared by your insight. Because there are <laughs> studies that maybe not strengthening medulla, but they're looking at those exact pathways. So somehow yeah. you tapped into something. <laughs> oh man, um, no. But sincerely, I, I I see myself as a bridge. You know, I I, I live in a lot of different communities. Um, obviously, the faith based community, um, the African American community, the music the musical community, and. Um, as someone who has struggled with mental illness, um, I've seen the benefit of the uh, scientific community being able to speak to these places. And I want to be a bridge. I think that we've we've seen, um, you know, and that's not the only legacy that I want to live, but as specifically as it pertains to this, yes, um, we've seen, obviously within the black community, just like the total, like, I don't know what therapy is. I don't know. I don't, you know, I don't do all that stuff. And, and just them understanding the necessity of a lot of these things Um, in the musical community, a lot of artists and musicians are, are brilliant and struggling with mental illness simultaneously. And they don't even realize that a lot of their, their art is stemmed from depression or anxiety or 
you know, other types of disorders. And so just helping them understand that relationship so that they can find health. Um, I don't think it's coincidental that, you know, the musician community has the quote unquote 27 club where all these artists died at 27 years old, uh, you know? And so, um, and then obviously in the faith-based community to erase a lot of the stigmas as well. I think there's this misconception that, you know, the, the, the brain is not a physical entity, that it is all spiritual. And so to take medication is unspiritual, to seek therapy outside of a pastor or a priest or whatnot is somehow uh, unbiblical. And so just to close those gaps uh, would be very uh, encouraging for me. It's something that I, I, I strive uh, to be able to do. And so, yeah, I would love to see that happen. And I guess what I would say is this, is that I think that um, we're all in a in a band and too many of us are playing solos and we sound a lot better when we play together, you know, when, we, when all this stuff is mixed together and now there's information that is, you know, uh, widespread. And so you can um, embrace some of these cultural, things, but then also add the scientific uh, elements to it. And we're all healthier. So. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I appreciate it to both of you for doing that in your own ways already. And for even coming on this podcast and doing that in this conversation, merging the science and the mental health and the faith and community. I think it's so, so important. So definitely, yeah. definitely appreciate the way you both contributed. And I'll be following the ongoing work that you all are doing. Yeah, Car, exactly. you're the you're the bridge that gives me hope. Oh man! Wow! Well, I need you. I, I'm honored. And listen, I need you all to continue being brilliant because otherwise, I don't know what I'm doing out here. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're all working together for the same cause in a lot of ways. So, yeah. definitely yeah. appreciate Dr. Amy Arnston Lecrae. Thanks so much for joining on the Addy Hour. It's been a pleasure. I know this is going to be enjoyable for folks to listen to as well. I think a lot of things that will equip people too. So. Yeah, appreciate it. Honored, sincerely. Yeah.